Hello everyone, and welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. On this show, we explore the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. Today, we're going to look at the impact of immigration bans on workers and employers. Over the last few weeks, the news media has been overflowing with information about the President's executive order banning immigration from seven countries. The states of Washington and Minnesota joined forces to appeal that ban, which was overturned by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, while the news has reported on the circumstances around the immigration ban and the backlash to it, they've done very little to talk about how these kinds of executive orders can affect the average worker in the United States. Today, we're fortunate to have some people in the studio who are very familiar with the impact of changes to immigration on business and on the visa holders who may have their international travel curtailed by immigration bans. Joining us to discuss the impact on employers is Linda Kawamura. Linda is a certified HR professional and the human resources manager at Oceanet, one of Hawaii's primary employers of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics workers. Jay Ho Choi is also joining us. He's an architecture major at the University of Hawaii, and he is here on a student visa from South Korea. And joining us from Finland, we have Hanu Peli, an international MAHRM student who is planning to graduate this May. Welcome all our guests. Um, and before we get started, I would invite you to join in on the conversation. You can do that by calling our telephone line at area code 415 871-2474, or you can tweet us at at ThinkTechHI. So again, welcome guests. Um, Linda, I would like to start with you. Uh, there are so many misconceptions out there about who and how uh, people go about the process of getting visas to work in the United States, mm -hmm. um, particularly the H-1B visa. And those are primarily the people that you employ. Correct. So what kinds of positions are held at Oceanet by people who hold H-1B visas? Well, Oceanet is an innovation company where we require um, the incumbents to have um, advanced degrees. Mm -hmm. Many of them are 25% of our people are PhDs. As, so these are in the STEM um, area or science, technology, engineering, and math, highly technical people. Mm -hmm. But what makes them also different is they have to have heart and um, that would thrive in our kind of innovation culture. So some of the positions we have would be chemical engineers, materials engineers, um, software developers in artificial intelligence, um, physics majors, um, and also design thinking, user-centered um, uh, analysts mm -hmm. and consultants. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to find them with um, you know, in the United States, but also, uh, so that's why we, we tend to, we might go globally too. Also, they need to understand um, a global environment because many of our clients are global. Mm -hmm. And so uh, cultural diversity, as well as an, an understanding of the world market is very important. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason, those are the kinds of positions that we tend to um, refer to H-1B visas. Right. Um, so what is the screening process like for those positions? Okay, the screening process is the same, whether they're H-1B visa, resident alien, or um, domestic employer, employers, mm -hmm. employees. Mm -hmm. um, basically, we recruit heavily um, at the universities and also um, through social media. And then once we have um, applicants, they would come by, we would um, have them apply, and then we go through a series of interviews, myself, um, the hiring manager, mm -hmm. colleagues, and people that they work, would work with. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, we, we ask for samples of work. Um, for software developers, we're asking them to complete a coding challenge. And for um, writers, uh, because they would need to be involved in uh, writing proposals, mm -hmm. we ask for writing samples. Then we do reference checks and then make a selection thereafter. Okay, so it, when you talk about reference checks, mm -hmm. what kinds of reference checks uh, do you do? Because I know one of the misconceptions uh -huh. is that the uh, visa process mm -hmm. uh, could actually allow folks 
that may have criminal records or, or a history of, of miscreant behavior in their home countries mm -hmm. uh, to come into the United States mm -hmm. and perhaps to perpetrate some mischief here. Mm -hmm. So what does screening look like uh, for those folks who, who are coming over on H-1B visas? Primarily our um, screening involves talking to prior managers mm -hmm. or professors and we ask them the quality and quantity of their work, their product production. Uh, we would ask them what their interests are um, and how we can see if there's a match to what our needs or not. Um, we do ask um, uh, for background information. Um, now, for we are a defense contractor, so mm -hmm. um, we, they may need to be required to do a security clearance. Um, with, depending on the position, not all right. positions require security clearance. Mm -hmm. In that sense, um, there may need to be a need for um, citizenship at that point. Okay, mm -hmm. but other than that, it sounds like you're looking for the best candidate for the position, Correct. regardless right. of things like country of origin, oh, citizenship status, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, but and again, it's the technical skills are super important. That's what we look at. But it's also heart and heart meaning. Are they curious? Do they, would they fit and thrive in our organization? Are they innovative? Um, they need to be multi-talented and transdisciplinary um, and flexible, adaptable, um, able to work in um, a kind of a chaotic environment, which is changes frequently. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I can see where that's, that would preclude, well, 99.9% .9 of the population regardless of where they come from. Exactly. So uh, so it sounds like if, if for some reason the government would compel employers mm -hmm. to either stop recruiting globally for those mm -hmm. kinds of positions or put huge restrictions on employers who require uh, a global mindset from their employees mm -hmm. that Oceanit might be in a fair amount of trouble as far as accomplishing your goals and objectives and living up to your mission statement. Exactly. Diversity, out-of-the-box thinking, um, having that those talents um, that it can be working in a global market, that's critical to our mission. So yeah, if those are cur curtailed, we probably will not be able to meet our mission and our objectives and our goals as well as we could do. Mm -hmm. uh, we would have to make do with whatever that we had. So mm -hmm. the more diversity and um, uh, ability to, to collaborate together mm -hmm. from different perspectives, the better we are as a company and the better we can service our clients. Right. Now, speaking of clients, you said you had global, yes. uh, a global client base. Uh -huh. um, so how important is it that the people assigned to some of these products, right. um, product development, research and development, these mm -hmm. kinds of things, how important is it that they actually understand um, what the end user will actually be doing with mm -hmm. whatever product you're making? And how do you ensure that the end user is getting exactly what they need? So we involve or incorporate design thinking in our whatever we do. Mm -hmm. What is design thinking? And it was brought to us probably about four or five years ago where we work with the client in identifying their needs. M many clients don't know, they know what they want, but they may not know what they actually need. So in the past, it was engineering, we build it and hope people buy it. Mm -hmm. That's not how it works anymore. We want to make sure that we understand. So we observe the clients, we um, work with them, we provide prototypes, and we ask the client what they need, you know, what they like and don't like about a certain product or service. Mm -hmm. And then we work with the client. So it's a very user-centered type of um, engineering or um, problem solving. Mm -hmm. And I'm imagining the folks on those product development teams need to have a sufficient knowledge of cross-cultural sure. issues and yes. communication so that when a client talks about their needs, um, that team uh, gets a good sense of what they're talking about without requiring a lot of follow-on communication. That too, but also it in also involves having excellent listening skills, uh, observation skills, and being able to um, gain insight into what, a, just because a person says something doesn't necessarily mean what they're thinking, but so we need to be able to infer and get insight from um, their communication, verbal and nonverbal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've, I've, had, I've often had circumstances where if I gave a client what they asked for, I wasn't giving them what they wanted. Exactly. Right? Because yeah. 
they articulated it in a way maybe that wasn't as clear. Right. Yeah? yeah. So I've got to ask this question, Linda, because it's it's one of the sort of preconceived notions about um, folks who come into the United States mm -hmm. for work purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, people say that immigrants are so-called taking our jobs. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that to be true, at least among the, yeah. now you're looking at a very sort of high level, uh, highly educated workforce. Um, so you're not finding that to be true? Not, ex not at all. We have so many opportunities here at Oceanet that we, um, we're not taking jobs. In fact, we're always looking for talented people. And right now, I can tell you that we have an artificial intelligent software developer or a senior electrical design engineer or a systems engineer, civil engineer. And um, these are um, highly technical positions. Again, I'm looking for someone that also has someone that can thrive in that innovative culture mm -hmm. of mind to market, which we call is with mind, meaning we come up with uh, a design or a solution, and then we commercialize that technology. So we're, looking, we're always looking for talent. And sometimes, because we're changing, we may be looking for someone that may meet the other qualifications, maybe not specifically, but they might have other talents or skills. So we mm -hmm. are also recruiting for the future. Mm -hmm. So there might be a position that we don't even know we need right now, but down the line, we make our connections, and at the appropriate time, there may be an opportunity out there. Looks like you're surrounded by two, yep. um, <laughs> two sources potential of, of future and potential talent. That's right. Uh -huh. Um, so, Hanu, let me, let me ask you very quickly. Now, you are from Finland, mm -hmm. uh, and you're here working on a master's degree in human resource management, hooray. Um, so you're surrounded by HR people now. Um, what was the visa process like for you? Uh, it wasn't an easy process. It took a long time. Like, first of all, you have to apply it online, mm -hmm. and it's about 200 bucks nowadays. And they go through your background check. You have to provide your financial information, your family background, travel background, everything. And the next step is to have an interview. For me, it was in Helsinki, the capital mm -hmm. of Finland. Mm -hmm. And there, they also go through an interview. So basically, they want to know what I study, why I want to go to the United States, do I have enough uh, money to provide, provide my living here. And then also, they do a complete background check again. They take my fingerprints and everything. So it's, a, it's not an easy process. Okay. Good. Uh, well, not good that it's it's uh, not easy, but good that they're very thorough. And I think uh, talking about your experiences helps to uh, uh, blow a hole in some of the preconceived notions about uh, folks that come over and the processes they go through. Uh, we are going to take a break right now. It's, it's time to do that. But when we come back, Jay, I want to talk to you about the process you went through. Mm -hmm. And then I want to talk to both of our students primarily, as well as you, Linda, about um, how sort of this ongoing political environment of vitriol uh, may be sort of casting a shadow on, on the way we communicate with one another and the way, uh, the experiences that you have. So go get some coffee or a drink. This is working together on Think Tech Hawaii. We'll be right back. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Please join me every other Monday to hear lawyers from Hawaii discussing ways to reach across the sea and help people and bring people together. Aloha. Hi, this is uh, Jane Sugimura. I'm the co-host for Condo Insider and we're on Think Tech Hawaii every Thursday at 3 o'clock and we're here to talk about uh, condominium living and uh, issues that affect condominium residents and owners and I hope you'll join us every week on Thursday. Aloha! Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. And we're back. Welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and we are discussing the impact of immigration bans on workers and on employers. And right now, I want everyone to meet Jeho Choi, who is finishing up a doctoral degree in architecture 
at the University of Hawaii, uh, who is also a student visa holder from South Korea. And Jay, please tell us about the process you had to go through in order to get the visa to come and study at, in Hawaii. Where first you, you apply to university and then get the accepted letter, and then, um, then you can move on to uh, applying for the visa. <laughs> and it's the same, the, pretty much the same process. You pay two hundred dollar, and there is a service fee, which is another, another fee. Like hun I paid one hundred sixty dollars yeah, for that. So, mm -hmm. the two separate. Um, and then in in South Korea, we have only Seoul. In Seoul, they have only embassy. So I live a little south. So I have to take a train about three hours to go up mm -hmm. early morning, and then get the interview done. And then of course it. They take the fingerprint and everything. Mm -hmm. Also, background check um, uh, and the bank statement that I have enough uh, fund. Or mm -hmm. if not, they will ask for a sponsor, which is usually parents for right. most cases. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you feel that the process? Th this is a question for both of you, but Jay, I, I'd like to hear from you first. Do you feel that the process that you went through in order to get your student visa was? Uh, it sounds like it was very thorough, but do you also think that it was fair and that it could possibly uh, prevent, shall we say, mischief makers from perhaps gaining entrance to the United States via the student visa process? I think that that process was yeah, thorough enough to, to um, uh, screen out some of the people who might mis have a mischief in America, plus um, the, it's, it's the only country that I think that I really apply for visa to study, so I cannot speak about other countries. But um, I, I know that if you want to come to Korea to study, where I have um, Chinese uh, students who are studying in Korea, they also have the similar process, so to get into Korea and then study. So I think each country have a pretty much similar um, student visa process. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very very safe, I would say. Good. Hanu, mm -hmm. did you feel that the process was uh, thorough enough to prohibit uh, people with negative intent from possibly coming to the U.S.? I think so. I think it's really hard to cheat. Cheat there, so they go through everything. So mm -hmm. That's why I think it was fair, but it was just strict enough for, okay. for people that are trying to cheat. That's good, because I think there is a misconception out there among, say, the general public, and, and maybe people that have some fear uh, around immigration and terrorism issues, that people will look for any avenue possible to enter the U.S. with the purpose of doing something harmful um, to the rest of us. But if you guys feel, having just gone through this process, that it is a thorough screen and that it, it probably would uh, stop at least the most obvious possible miscreants. I, I think that's a, a good testimony to the process. Now, let me ask you guys this. Um, you're both international students. You're both from outside the U.S. Have you noticed any change, say, in the way strangers and others treat you, either classmates that may be from different places or, or folks you run into on the street, neighbors, roommates, etc.? Are, are you finding the, the vitriol and, and uh, spite that seems to be pervasive right now um, coming into the relationships that, that uh, you have with others? Hanu, you go first. Nothing like that. Like uh, from the day one, I always feel welcomed here and it's, it's still like that. Even though Trump is president right now and uh, things are what they are, people have always been friendly towards me here in Hawaii. That's good. So you've never experienced any sort of negative, uh, unneighborly or unwelcoming behaviors? Nothing like that. From never. here in Hawaii? Never. Oh, that's good to know because we hear stories that are, that are not pleasant. Jay, what about you? Oh, I, I have the same experience as uh, Hanu. Like, uh, it's very friendly. And then um, I was, I'm in the Global Track um, program, mm -hmm. which allows me to study in America, and then one year I have to go to China. So with the local students here, mm -hmm. which is also part of the team, we share rooms and everything. So for almost two years, we were always together. So I think that made me more inclusive mm -hmm. within the students and then have more stronger ties yeah. with friends. Although I have to say, Jay, if you were to tell me that you graduated from McKinley High School, I'd believe you. 
<laughs> so, you know, that's, um, <laughs> you look like one of us. <laughs> so. Now, Linda, let me ask you this. Because you have a very global workforce, yes. are you noticing any sort of um, uh, conversations that kind of devolve into arguments or anything like that over politics? No, not at all. Okay. However, there is some maybe fear because of the unknown for those that are on H-1B visas as to what would happen in the future. Mm -hmm. That would be an issue. And then as we, some of the applicants I'm talking to, who many of them um, are on F1s and maybe want to go into uh, OPT or H-1B visa, mm -hmm. they had questions about that. That's an, a difference that I've seen. Mm -hmm. But no inner, um, anything different than uh -huh. how it was before. Because I was just reading uh, the Sherm Daily Bulletin. Yeah. I get the yeah. Sherm Bulletin every day. Uh, and they said that, uh, they survey HR professionals uh -huh. every day on various questions. And this particular one dealt with uh, political discussions in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And they said that since the election, mm -hmm. 35 to 40 percent of HR professionals who took part in the survey reported at least one instance of a political con uh, conversation devolving into argument mm. to the point where organizations are trying to think about whether they should have sort of anti-political discussion policies. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit doctrinaire for me, yeah. but um, you know, but how do we as HR people really keep, keep the attitude mellow uh, and, mm -hmm. and allow for free expression but not allow for abuse and and vitriol to really uh, negatively affect the workplace. Sure, and I think it starts stems from our philosophy of equal employment opportunity for everyone, mm -hmm. and having that in, uh, inclusive environment, collaborative environment, and always promoting that. Um, and then, if political or some other kinds of forms that cause conflict. And uh, nipping it in the bud and addressing it mm -hmm. in a professional manner. I think that's how we have um, worked on that before. There is more talk about um, the impact of the political scene on the future of employment, but it's nothing to get into an argument. It's sure. just more, peop more people are just um, talking about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have noticed sort of in the, in the circles I move in that people are actually afraid. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would normally be, even if, say, Hanu and I are having a political conversation, even if we disagree uh -huh. on, on topic, we can still have a passionate and robust discussion mm -hmm. without entering the realm of insult mm -hmm. or, uh, or anything like that, you know, talking solely about the issues and the ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but n recently, I've been noticing a real sort of hesitancy to have those kinds of conversations. And I think it's sad because a well-informed populace is the best defender of democracy. Mm -hmm. So if we're not able to listen to one another and learn from one another, it's the governmental structure that, mm -hmm. um, that suffers in the long run. Mm -hmm. So now guys, international students, let me ask you. Um, I don't know, J I'm going to ask you first, because I don't know the degree to which polit politics and political issues might be discussed as part of an architecture curriculum, but do you, are you involved in, say, discussions in class about these issues, and, and do they seem to still be respectful and collegial? Well, yes. Uh, we're, we, don't, we don't really talk that much about the politics in the architecture area, but mm -hmm. um, certainly um, some, of the, some of the students where I live in East West Center, they seem to oh. be, because I live in East West Center, there are some students who is uh, I, I wouldn't say afraid of what is changing, but um, there are certain talks they're mm -hmm. talking about. They might be not coming back or they might, might not get a job in America and then just go back to their home countries. Right. So, right. Yeah. Hanu, what about you? Uh, not during classes, but uh, in everyday living, I hear it every day. Uh -huh. yeah. I live close to Hawaii. Uh -huh. It's a big, big, big apartment. And every day there is discussion about Trump and uh, his policy. What and do people say? Can you can uh, you squeal? Well, usually they're not happy. Uh huh. They're talking that he's uh, more like a businessman instead of a uh, policeman. Mm hmm. And uh, 
Well, let's just say that overall opinion is the negative. Mm -hmm. And I think like if somebody is with Trump, they are kind of afraid to say it because of their overall opinion. Okay. So that's how I feel. Okay. Uh, I have to say I agree with you because if we look sort of anecdotally at the polls right before the general election, it looked like the Democratic candidate was going to win based on polls. Well, that didn't happen. So clearly people who said, I support uh, the Democratic candidate um, may have behaved differently when they got into the ballot booth. Mm -hmm. So maybe people are afraid of, of um, coming out with an opinion that they think might be, might be greeted with criticism or rancor or anger. And that's bad. We, we need to fix that. Because certainly, Linda, I'm imagining that it would really put the kibosh on a lot of what you're trying to do in terms of maintaining a very innovative, very cooperative work environment. And I can really see it affecting the learning experience that the gentlemen have as far as maybe even changing their minds about education in the U.S. or staying here if you wanted to as opposed to maybe going to another country or returning home. Um, and frankly, we need all our good brains. Mm -hmm. And I think um, for me, when I started hearing about the travel ban, or the immigration ban, I should say, that was my biggest concern. Mm -hmm. um, if we are going to maintain a strong economy and a strong democracy, mm -hmm. we need to have the best brains available. And if the best brains aren't here already, because they were born here and raised here, then we should be importing those brains from elsewhere. Um, and I think for us is that um, collaboration with different perspectives is highly encouraged. Mm -hmm. And we, do we always agree? No. But we all bring our perspectives, and then we take the best of our perspectives, and we're a better company for that. Yeah. And yeah. so if we don't have, if everybody um, saying, oh, yeah, I agree with him, I agree with her, um, we don't have that healthy dialogue. Yeah, sycoph sycophants really wreck an environment. Well, guests, thank you so much. Uh, it's time for us to go, but uh, I would need to thank Hanu Pelli, Linda Kawamura, and Jay Choi for joining us today. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and I thank you again for joining us on uh, working together on Think Tech Hawaii. See you in two weeks. Bye.